There you go. Um, we're going to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on the Black community. I'm Jewel Dixon, a member of Harvest Community Church. I have been an occupational therapist for 20 years, and about 13 of those years I have spent um, teaching. And one of the other things that I do is kind of design community-based programs. And so um, I do a program at Tutwiler Prison, a senior program, um, at True Divine Baptist Church, and then also the work I do in Uganda. So I kind of have conversations with the community about health quite a bit. And um, this kind of came out of last week's Bible study to talk about how COVID is specifically impacting us and what we can do about that. And so these are some of the some of the headlines we've kind of been seeing for the past two weeks. Um, African Americans struggle with disproportionate COVID death toll. COVID-19 has healed multiple bishops and pastors within the nation's largest Black Pentecostal denomination. Um, COVID-19 exposes mistrust, health care inequality going back generations for African Americans. Black Americans face alarming rates of co coronavirus infection in some states. And so over the last couple of weeks, we've seen more and more the impact specifically on African American communities. And, you know, one of the people that we have looked to in the past to give information is Dr. David Satcher. He's a former U.S. Surgeon General. And this is kind of his impression. He says, my impression is that COVID-19 disproportionately impacts African Americans because cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, and a lot of other of these problems also disproportionately impact us as well. And so what he is alluding to are health disparities. And so you cannot talk about COVID-19 and not talk about health disparities. Health disparities are preventable differences in how disease, injury, violence, and other kind of opportunities in achieving optimal health are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. And those are not necessarily always African Americans. So from Arkansas to West Virginia is the stroke belt. More strokes happen in that geographical region than in any other part of the country. That is not necessarily related to race or gender, just geography, the way we eat, the lack of exercise in this part of the country makes us more predisposed to having strokes. And so if you add to that the other issues impacting African-Americans, you see we're even more disadvantaged in disadvantaged situations. But a lot of the health disparities that we see in the United States specifically impact us. And so I'm gonna talk about a couple because many of these are the ones we're seeing specifically with COVID-19. And so kind of, this is just six. There are others that are pervasive but, but the ones that are kind of our primary focus are obesity. So 48% of adults are obese that are black. If you look specifically at women, 80% of black women in America are overweight or obese. If you look at children, we have severe rates of childhood obesity. Thinking about diabetes, we're 80% more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes. And when we're diagnosed, we're typically gonna have the end stage renal disease. We're gonna have the visual impairments. We're gonna have the amputations. We're gonna be hospitalized. When we look at heart disease, men are 30% more likely, but women are 60% more likely to be hypertensive. Hypertension seems to be a pervasive issue in the black community. We are diagnosed earlier and we're less likely to have our blood pressure under control. Now, hypertension happens as we get older. Over 65, 50% of people have hypertension anyway, but we get it younger and, we're, and it's less likely to be controlled well or managed with medication. When it comes to cancer, um, black women are 40% more likely to die of breast cancer. We get a more aggressive form of breast cancer. Um, black men are more likely to have new cases of colon cancer. Um, children are more likely to have asthma. And so asthma is very much environmentally related. So where you live, pest control issues, pollution, mold, all those kind of things contribute to asthma. Our babies are more likely to have a low birth rate and more likely to die. Black women are more likely to die during childbirth. The numbers in Alabama for black women mirror that in many countries in Africa. 
um, from a mental health perspective, 20% of us are likely to report some kind of psychological distress, but less than 50% of us will get any kind of help. And so when you look at kind of what's impacting us, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, um, issues related to children and mothers and then mental health, you know, why do you think our community has these specific issues? This is where you all talk. Hey, you, I was, you said that we're going back to the previous slide. Yep. So even under medication, I think you said somewhere even under med, when medicated, it's still like less likely to be affected? Or, um, or maybe I mis misread, misheard you. I didn't hear the first part of what you said. For which one, heart disease? I'm not sure where, somewhere that even if we're if even if we're receiving medication, we're less likely to um, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, my, my words aren't coming out very well, but it, it's still less likely to be helped. Like we're, we're still going to suffer from certain medical issues um, in the black community. We are because medication is only part of the solution. You have to also make the lifestyle changes that come with that. But we're also less likely to take our medication consistently. So that is one of the reasons when heart disease, um, why you see um, blood pressure issues not being controlled well. So that is also a factor. Okay. No, um, so what? Go ahead. I'm there's a wide range of issues. Um, but yeah, we do have to do the work ourselves to, um, to make better choices on what we eat and our activity and those kinds of things. Okay. Um, you know, but there's certainly a lot just that. Um, so you, like environmental issues are, are a huge impact as well. Um, trust of, 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 of med medicine. That's funny, my, you know, I'm talking to Christian um, um, and even he at his age, brought up the whole Tuskegee experiments and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On those and, and, and worry about, you know, are people really telling the truth? And I'm like, at his age, you're still worried about that. <laughs> but I mean, it's pervasive, unfortunately. It, it is. It is. Mistrust of health care is often passed down generation to generation, but it's also the experiences you have on your own. So that is uh, one of the reasons why people don't access health care the way they should. So, are, are there any other thoughts about why we see so many health disparities in our community? Oh, I definitely think um, part of it is uh, education um, as far as um, com just being aware of um, issues, you know, health issues that are, are going on and, um, you know, uh, now you see more opportunities, you see people reaching out to, you know, doing, um, making the community more aware or trying to engage the community. You, you'll hear of, you know, different types of outreach, but that's, that's kind of fairly new. Mm -hmm. um, there's not really, you know, a, a lot of times we as a people just don't know. There are things that, that um, is fairly new for our communities um, or people see that some things don't or tend to think that some things don't apply to them. It's not, it's not a prevalent issue um, among considering some of the other things that um, people have to deal with, okay. you know, so it's um, the education piece is to say that good health is, a, is available to everybody, no matter what your, your, your economic status is, um, no matter, you know, whatever else is going on in life. You know, so just kind of educating people that you have the right to resources that can improve your quality of life. 
Um, and I, and, and there again, I think a lot of times it's a low priority when you're thinking about other things like being safe or mm-hmm. just survival. having right mm-hmm. survival mm-hmm. or having enough food, let alone what type of food. Um, so just really letting, you know, educating people and showing them, um, little things that they can that they can do you know exercise is not just for a certain group of people and it, it's mm-hmm. not just going to a gym mm-hmm. you know there are things that you can do so just kind of making it making it simple simple things that people can latch on to yeah. I think when you, go ahead i was gonna say when when tish i mean yeah when you mentioned the education part I think back to how recently I went to the doctor with my mom Mm -hmm. and being at the doctor with my mom and the questions I asked and the answers that we received and my mom said, you didn't tell me that. And and, and her doctor said, well, you didn't ask me that. So just being educated enough to know what should she be asking for her to know overall the steps she needs to take. And so dealing with, you know, doctors that don't relate to you that don't think it important enough to tell you the alternatives for your situation or or answer questions you might not be educated enough to to answer you know for them or even ask what the different options are and then kind of piggybacking again on what tish was saying and and what you just said about the folks thinking about surviving you know Mm -hmm. getting employed and possibly being able to afford the health insurance. You may have the health insurance, but then there's this fear of, can I take off from work to even go to the doctor to see about myself? Or do I need to save those days if my children get sick? And what's the quickest thing I can do to get back in the game or cover up? Because the first thought is I need to survive. And that is not the priority until there's a real, until there's a real problem. And I think you guys have said what the research is saying. Um, Health disparities are linked to genetics. So we're sometimes more predisposed to things. The lack of economic resources, um, the type of foods you buy, um, where you go and buy them, um, limited access to health care in general. But the number one way we deter people from accessing health care is co-pays. So if you look at the kind of insurance that a lot of people have, the co-pay is what's used to to encourage you not to get treatment. They typically are gonna increase the copay. Even if your monthly premium is not very much, if you have a $50 copay, you have to really think about, am I gonna go to the doctor? So which means we're gonna delay treatment. So I may not go when I first have symptoms because I don't have the time off from work, just like you mentioned. I just, you know, um, I'm, I'm just not gonna think about it. I'm in survival mode. Our cultural beliefs that we really don't trust the doctors. We don't trust healthcare. Um, low literacy kind of in general, but what you guys are talking about is healthcare literacy. We don't know a lot of times what we need to ask the doctor, um, what we should, the kind of care we should be receiving, and then all those other environmental factors that kind of shape our lives in America. So you guys were dead on about what, why we're saying there's these, all these health disparities within our community. And so I'm going to kind of shift the COVID-19 conversation back, but you cannot talk about us and COVID-19 without in the back of your mind thinking about health disparities, because that's Jewel, really, yes. Jewel, I'm sorry. Um, let me ask everybody on the line, could you mute your, your devices? Uh, we're just getting feedback. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. So I'm going to move the conversation back to COVID-19, but keep in mind some of the things we just talked about with health disparities. And so what I did was look at how Black people are being impacted by COVID-19 from Africa to Alabaster. Like, what does it look like for us right now with COVID-19? And so the first case was diagnosed in Africa, um, in the country of Egypt in February. The BBC seems to believe Africa is the next place we're going to see a surge in numbers. Um, Right now, though, that's not the case, but that's what they believe. They're going to kind of be that second area where you're going to see a surge in numbers. (laughs) 
And so, but national data kind of looks like this, and this is kind of what those headlines represented, that we only make up about 13% of the population, but about 30% of the cases of COVID-19 are African-American. And this is just preliminary data because not every state collects data regarding race, regarding gender. Some people just record data by age. In fact, the Democrats had to put forth legislation to record data based on race. And then also depends on where you get tested versus a health department or um, a pop-up kind of testing center or at a hospital. So all of those people record data differently, but the data we've had access shows that 30% of those with COVID-19 are African-American. And so then looking at who is dying of COVID-19, a third of those people are African-American when really we're only making up about 14% of the population in the areas that they covered. And the Associated Press is kind of where I got this data from. But what really hit home for me were the numbers. And so I don't know how well you can see this particular slide, but like in District of Columbia, there have been 80 deaths, and this was probably about two weeks ago. 61 of those 80 were African-American. Mississippi, 129 deaths, 85 for African-American. Louisiana has been very hardly hit, especially Baton Rouge. 805 deaths, 524 of those were African-American. South Carolina, 82 deaths, 46 were African-American. Georgia, 583 deaths, 319 of those were African-American. Alabama, 136 deaths, 74 were African-American. And so when you look at the hard numbers, you can really see how disproportionate it is in a lot of states across the United States. And so the, the age group seems to be the, where we're seeing the largest number of the caseloads is at 45 to 64 and then 65 to 74. They seem to be carrying the larger numbers of the cases of COVID-19. And so Alabama Department of Public Health puts out their data Monday through Friday. If you go on their website, it's always dated. They give you data every day. Um, but still, it's only who they know are receiving tests and reporting that data to them. We know that in the Black Belt, that's kind of the area with Shorter, Tuskegee, Macon County, that part of the state, and kind of going on over to Georgia they're not getting very many tests available. We know the wiregrass is, that's kind of that Dothan area. They don't have very much testing in that area too. So we really don't have a, a true picture of how many people are getting tested and therefore diagnosed, but this is the best data Alabama kind of has to offer right now. And so male to female is fairly equal. Race-wise for Alabama, the numbers are less. But we do have an unknown category of people that we don't know what their race was. And then we don't know how many of us are accessing tests. And access is a big thing for me. So when the Church of the Highlands offered to set up a testing site on 280, I thought that was a wonderful thing. But if they had also done one at the fairgrounds or crossplex, I know that more of us would have had access to those tests. And so even where we're getting tests initially was kind of limited. Now the health department does have some testing available, but still when it comes to access for our community, it's, it's limited. And so when we look kind of in Alabama about who has died from COVID, um, it's about 44% black, about 50% white, and the underlying conditions are the health disparities we talked about before, chronic lung disease, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, renal failure. There is a group of people that had no underlying conditions, but the primary factor for that group has been age. They're typically going to be older adults. So the median age is 76, but the range is about 48 to 96. So that particular group were older. When you look at kind of this other group with underlying conditions, the number one condition was cardiovascular disease. And so that has been a strong contributor to those that have died from COVID-19. And so even more local. So this is from today. I looked at this a couple of hours ago. So Jefferson County has 828 cases. Of those, 33 people have died. Mobile, 888. 40 have died. Shelby County, 298. Eight have died. Montgomery County, 284. And four have died. So this is data as of today. And so 
It is great that we're getting more testing out there, but I don't know how well everyone's able to access what is now available. And that's one of the challenges. And so I guess my next question for you guys is why we experience a greater impact of COVID-19. So I gave you all the data. Why do you think we're experiencing this worse than other groups are? Hey, Jewel, this is Valerie. Hey, Valerie. You say we as in African-Americans. As an African-American. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it just coincides with what everyone else has said. Uh, it saddens me because when I, I've seen this on the news and I, I think about it, it's like, well, why is it that there's such a greater impact on, uh, for us, a negative impact? Why is it? And I do, I have to say it has to do with, I, I agree, a lack of education. I don't think we perhaps believe that it's going to impact us, that we're going to be affected. Uh, I do under, understand about the underlying causes because of diabetes, hypertension, and all those things. But I think there's some of us who really don't believe that we're going to be impacted. Mm -hmm. And so we don't do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't even try to do anything. And uh, someone sent a picture. Uh, I I can't remember, it may have been someone from the church, uh, the openings in Atlanta, people are lined up at the nail salon and who was lined up? It was us. Mm -hmm. Now they had on masks, but they were lined up to get those mm -hmm. nails done. I'm like, is it that important right now to get the nails done? Mm -hmm. But you know, sometimes I think we, there are things that are important to us that perhaps they shouldn't be so important to us. So priorities. Right. Okay. All um, right. I would, uh, I think in addition to all of the incredible data that you have given, Jewel, I think one of the other things we have to take into consideration is, uh, is demographics and, and where African-Americans are living mm -hmm. that where the highest disparities, when you take, take a look in, in places like the state of New York, uh, mm -hmm. the epicenter are, are in those boroughs Mm -hmm. where you have a majority of African-American Latinos that are living in close proximity in high-rise apartments mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. So you, so the social distancing stuff is, uh, is almost out the window in many mm -hmm. respects because uh, there was one area, I think, uh, some whatever that place called it, some Rochelle in, 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 in New York that was kind of the epicenter. And you notice it almost just went away like a blink of an eye. Mm -hmm. uh, once they contained it, but when it got down to the boroughs of, of, of Queens and and, um, and and some of the other areas in New York, and then you look in places like Detroit, uh, also you're dealing with the same kind of urban dynamics and things like that. And uh, so some of your bigger cities where African Americans are living, where you have a high concentration of people, uh, I think also are contributing to the the high rise the, the incredible numbers that are with our people that are you know, unfortunately are contracting this as a part of it in addition to everything else that you said here so okay i agree with that as well anyone well, hey, else hey uh church family this is so cool that this is happening um i love uh the prosperous and purposeful presbyterians <laughs> Um, the one thing I would say um, that I'm very cautious about is framing um, the disparity in terms of personal choice instead of structural inequity. Um, one of the things that has always bothered me, so we understand the social determinants of public health, and so like uh, <laughs> safe at home, stay at home, uh, when we have an affordable housing crisis, <laughs> uh, thinking about that, thinking also about access to health care, um, one of the things that everyone lauded uh, Church of the Highlands for doing what they did on 280, but if you read the directions, they said, uh, even though that they were waiving, uh, you know, they would pay for health care, I mean, access to health care is key. 
So in a state that we don't have expanded access or real access to Medicaid in a state where we have an affordable housing crisis in the state where we have issues where most of our service workers and many of our folks are black are so proprietor our black businesses are 95 percent so proprietors so i don't think it's an issue of priorities as it's most an issue of disparities i think as we as black folks we have to make sure that we don't fall into uh the same sort of uh traps of thinking and intellectual uh, dogma uh, that continue to undermine us as a community. I think our focus should be on the structural inequities instead of sort of some moralistic stuff. So. Well, thank you. I think that the three of you all kind of hit um, the next slide on the head. And so there are really no definitive answers about why we've been more greatly impacted. But there have been four key things and some which have been mentioned um, why we know we've been impacted. So initially it was misinformation. Um, if you're on social media, you may have seen those early memes that we just couldn't get it. Um, which kind of brings me back um, in, my, in my lifetime to when HIV first came on the scene. And so we think viruses have morality or they have concerns about gender or race. And none of those things are true. Viruses do not care. They just need a host. And so initially there was misinformation about could we get it? And by the time we realized we could get it, those numbers definitely had kind of skyrocketed. And then access, access to healthcare, access to testing, um, just basic primary care is an issue in Alabama. And then you add to that having testing. And so initially you had to go to your primary care physician to get a test and you also had to have insurance. And so that was a limiting factor early on for people when they initially were symptomatic. The underlying health conditions we've kind of talked about before. And then a lot of us are employed um, in jobs that are essential and have higher rates of exposure. And so black people still kind of provide a lot of the service to America. Within healthcare, um, other industries, you see we are employed in areas that are not only essential, but we're coming in contact with a lot of people, like your grocery stores, like your Walmarts, like your Lowe's, and so our risk of exposure and rates of exposure are much higher. And so we don't have an exact answer, but we know these things are contributing factors to why those numbers look the way they do. But I'm going to be honest with you all, I think COVID is going to at some point go away. But if we don't talk about health disparities and health inequities, I think we've missed a good opportunity. And so I like this quote, it's by George C. Benjamin. Um, he's the executive director of the American Public Health Association. We get a lot of misinformation circulating through our communities. We fundamentally do not trust some of the non-Black institutions because they do not serve us well. We need to make sure our trusted institutions, clinicians of color, Churches, community organizations are better educated. I, I want to say we should be the best educated when it comes to what is happening and impacting our community. And so I'm going to throw this slide in because this is kind of information I typically give to people when I talk about health. And so when it comes to COVID-19, how can you protect yourself? Well, you can wear a mask. Um, it's going to be the law, we believe, um, starting on Friday. Um, wash your hands, sanitize your environment, sanitize your hands when you go out, be very conscious, practice social distancing to the best of your ability. Um, but here's what you can do when it comes to health disparities in general for yourself. We will talk about the bigger issues next, but for you, if you don't have a primary care physician, you get one you trust. Um, there are five big numbers I think every person should know. You should know your blood pressure. You should know what your blood pressure is. You should know your BMI. So that's just looking at height and weight ratio. If it's over 25, you're overweight. If it's over 30, you're obese. Now we know that there's a bias related to the BMI, that it does not take into account body types. And black people seem to carry weight very well. So the next best thing is waist circumference. So for men under 40, for women under 35, we know that having more weight abdominally puts you at greater risk for hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. That particular type of weight puts you at greater risk. 
know your glucose levels. The fasting, when you just don't eat and they test you in a doctor's office, and then your A1C looks over the course of three months and you need to be under six. And then your cholesterol levels. So you should kind of know these numbers and track them year to year to see kind of what your health looks like. Vitamin D. There's been some good research coming out of Spain and China that shows there was decreased vitamin D levels in those that experience greater COVID-19 symptoms. African Americans traditionally have lower vitamin D levels. One is just genetic. Um, melanin does not metabolize it in the same way. We don't always eat vitamin D fortified foods, especially dairy. And then we don't go out, out in the sun and spend long periods of time. So getting your vitamin D test, but also taking a supplement can help minimize some of your risk. Um, exercise, most days of the week do something. Um, your diet, manage that well. We, we hope it can be um, as plant-based and lean meat and low carb as possible. Um, but really examining our diets and see how we can better choose what we eat a lot of our dietary choices are circumstantial, are generational, and those hangovers come from really just our time in America. But diet is a strong contributor to health and or disease. And then more than anything, manage your stress. Stress is a strong contributor to a lot of the things we talked about earlier. And so managing that as well. So when I think about what can you do personally, that's this slide. But the next question is, and that's kind of where we're going to end is what can Harvest Community Church do? So not just the COVID-19 conversation, but just the health disparity, health of our community conversation in general, what can we do? And so that's kind of where I'm going to end my part of the presentation. I put several resources at the very end of it, and I know Pastor Mike could be more than willing to share those with you. But I really want to have a conversation about what can Harvest Community Church do to improve a lot of things that I mentioned earlier. This is where you all talk. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, one thing I, I want to say is um, just looking at that list of uh, things that, that we can do, you, you mentioned how um, that quote was very impactful because people do not trust um, sometimes the voice that's delivering the message, you know. Um, and so one really important thing is to, for people just to, for us to get that word out, things, what, what people can do, sharing that type of information that's on that list, uh, starting with encouraging people to have a doctor and to, and to realize with doctors, it's a partnership. When you go into a doctor's office, it's, uh, they're asking you a lot of questions. You, have, you really have the upper hand as far as knowing, you know yourself better than anybody else. You may not realize that, but you, if you don't share symptoms, things that are going on with you, if you don't share your personal history, then they're just guessing. I mean, they're just working with what is standard until you, until you, you know, give uh, good information about yourself and know good information about yourself. And um, that's, that's really, really important. And unfortunately, um, as we were talking about a little bit earlier, they don't expect, they're not always going to, um, they're not always going to lead you to where you need to, to go if you do not take the initiative yourself. You know, I know um, a lot of times when, um, when I'm going to the doctor with my mother, I'm giving them a whole lot of information about what's going on with her. And I get this question a lot. Are you, 
are you in the medical field? Are you a doctor? You know, because they don't expect you to know. They don't expect you to know. And it really is a, a partnership. So we, we, need to, we need to know for ourselves. And mm -hmm. we need to know that we can know for ourselves. And it's not on a medical level. You know, you don't have to know words and terms. But like you said, a blood, taking your blood pressure, you can do that at home. You can take your blood sugar at home. You know, you can know what a good blood pressure is. You can know what your weight is. Um, but just being aware of those types of things, just taking some personal ownership wherever you are. And that's, I think that is something that we can encourage um, as a people. And addressing some of the tough issues. I know we briefly talked about, uh, we mentioned mental health. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something that we just don't really talk about in the, in the Black community. And it, um, it is a factor in so many facets of our of our lives you know in our community so just continuing to to bring these issues up and helping people to to know for themselves to you know if you i don't know being resourceful directing people you know if people don't know where to go as far as um resources are concerned insurance are concerned if we have people who can share that information to do those things, but building partnerships so that people can trust us and we, and then they can, um, we can help them to, you know, to connect with, with their own health through other partnerships that they need. But one is just really encouraging people to know that it is something that everybody deserves. It is something that everybody deserves. Thank you, Tish. I mean, those were great points. Just you're talking about basic health literacy, that everyone should know yeah. some basic things about their health, but also empowering people that they can be healthy, that health, good health is not just something reserved for other people, right. that we don't have to get certain diseases because we're black, that we can have more ownership in our health. And I, those are great points. Anyone else? Um. This is great. I'm so glad that you are doing this. Um, I've been uh, serving ec in the terms of economic development with BeHamStrong.com is sort of the city's response. It's the public-private coalition. So that is a good resources. You know, as someone who is a quote-unquote uh, recent <laughs> graduate who is still establishing himself financially, I stopped and really thought and was very grateful to God around the privilege that I have to still have a paycheck and have employee sponsored health insurance. And I think that it is incumbent upon us to invest in mutual aid societies, shop with black businesses, invest where we can, um, because this is the Christian mandate in my view, uh, that those who have are able to deploy um, when needed. And um, I, I will say the, the one thing that uh, bothers me the most in terms of the dialogue, and it's not to make anyone culpable or, you know, exculpate anybody of personal responsibility, but I have seen too much division in our community around blaming and reframing that is that urban, suburban, you know, all this other kind of stuff that we have, and we got to come together and fix this problem and really put our point in the, the structural and the urgencies. The one thing that should surprise no one is that one of the last states in health outcomes is also experiencing this. Like this has been in the data the entire time, and we've been asleep, <laughs> we've been tepid, and I think that you know it is our calling to invest. And so there are those are in addition to uh, like Tish and everyone has said like there are ways to help um and like i said you know i don't know what the next 90 days will look like for me uh, the running joke is that economic developers get real busy when there's no economy uh, <laughs> but uh you know i i am you know there the one of the things that's lacking is a a coordinated uh, black organization response and i'm gonna tell you that our folk 
we're not trying to talk to the Highlands folk, for real, for real. We ain't trying to talk to these folk. My grandmother just passed, and she had the son of the doctor that's been in Mobile for 100 years, okay? <laughs> the park has been serving Black folk for 100 years, and so we got to step up those who have been privileged to really invest in mutual aid, really push the policies, and really begin to invest. And so this is a great way, um, and I'm excited, and thank you so much for putting this together. This is exciting to me, um, but just know that that we we got to do it. So I, I very much agree. Well, Jewel, I don't know if you can hear me. Jewel, can you hear me? Um, She's nodding yes. Yeah, yes. I, want you to, I want you to answer this, um, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm speaking out of ignorance. Um, mm -hmm. I wish I had more information on it. But you mentioned when you introduced yourself in the very beginning about the initiatives that you're involved in, Tutwiler, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. Uganda, those mm -hmm. kind of things. And I think you mentioned a local one as well. Mm -hmm. As far as a church, this can be a real interesting question, you know, what can we do? Mm -hmm. Because there, there is kind of a tension between the question being asked, what can we do individually? Mm -hmm. And then what can we do as a whole, as a group, as a church? Um, in your working, have you developed or seen initiatives that were started by groups like us? You know our DNA, you know mm -hmm. that we're a small congregation. Have you seen some examples of groups our size doing some things, either campaigns, initiatives, um, money going to certain places that is, is, is small, but it's making a huge difference. What would you say? Um, so kind of during my time in Birmingham, the UAB School of Public Health gave churches money to do exactly this, to talk about health issues, um, to kind of leverage where you are in the community to bring in people that could talk about health and help people make healthier choices because it's the belief that people trust the church and so um that is an just option um just to say we're going to commit to to talking about health and really pushing some key things into the community about information from a policy perspective we need to hold our elected officials accountable about the health of our community. Nobody talks about it. You know, when um, Trump said, I didn't know that the Blacks were being impacted by COVID-19. He may not have, because the conversation about health disparities, but we don't hold the people that are elected to talk about the health, when how we're going to fund things like Medicaid. Um, the choice to not for to limit the services provided by Cooper Green now Mercy, that was a big deal, and most of us really didn't pay attention because we never used it. And so I think there are two things that need to happen: harvest needs to be healthier, so internally, and then some of that is a witness to the greater community. But really, just deciding who we want to focus on: do we want to focus on older adults? That's geographically maybe a good fit. If we want to focus on families, that may be a great fit too. But I think we have the platform and the knowledge just within our church to just begin to have that conversation and then kind of see maybe where it grows. But there is funding for it, just depending on what we want to Diabetes has its own set of money. Cardiovascular disease has its own pot of money. And they want churches to partner with them to communicate the information. So hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> Oh, that was very helpful. I want to transition and allow uh, Reverend Ron to kind of close out our time if there's not any other uh, discussion. But Jewel, before I leave that point, um, you know, I, I know it's difficult. I'm not going to put you on the spot with everybody here, but um, I do want to throw it out that we need a, a group of people who are committed to this on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not going to commission you and knight you as as the one that does that, but would you be willing to help get that together? I would. I mean, you know, kind of like Paul, I've helped lots of people. I would, you know, I would be remiss and not help my church family. So 
you yep. definitely have my support. Good, good. Reverend Ron? And I would say, can I say something real quick? I would say, Ooh. don't forget, we have the um, the medical ministry mm -hmm. people, Mary and um, Sharon and some other people who I'm sure would be willing to, and, and, and are knowledgeable, because I'm not. So just going to throw that out there. Thank you. Reverend? Yeah, what did you want me to do? Uh, close out. I know you guys collaborated on on. Hey, um, you know, Sister Jewel has done a magnificent job, and um, there's not a whole lot, you know, I can add to what she has has said. Um, uh, just a couple of practical things. I think on a very on the practical individual level, I, I agree with uh, Elijah. There are obviously structural things we need to focus on. Uh, but I also want us to focus on the low-hanging fruit, uh, the things that are really right there in our, uh, in our control that we can embrace and handle. Um, things like practice the buddy system when you go to the doctor. Take somebody with you. Because a lot of times when we go to the doctor, if we're the patient, we're not thinking very clearly because we're concerned. And we all know that typically when we go to the doctor, our blood pressure goes up. It's just kind of one of those automatic things that happens and you need someone there who is not the patient who's standing outside of the situation who can ask the kinds of questions that you as the patient may not may not ask or may not be thinking because you're trying to process everything that's going on so so try to do that if at all possible i think that's a good thing uh, to do be aware of your own family history Pay attention to your own family history. Don't wait till when you go to the doctor to find out, for the doctor to ask you all that stuff. You know what's been going on in your family. And I paid attention to what's going on in my family. I watched my family members when they died. I'm, I'm filing all of this stuff away when they died and what they died from and the things they did or did not do. And I told myself, I got to make some changes. I can't go forward doing that. And so, uh, so you need to know your own family history and the impact that the potential that can have on you. I know high blood pressure runs in my family. Uh, I only found out recently that diabetes ran in certain members of my family. I didn't know this. I'm sitting around having a conversation with my mom. So, oh yeah, you know, so-and-so has it. Mom, why didn't you tell us this? So you need to ask people those questions. You need to be aware of, of your own uh, family, family history uh, regarding those, those kinds of things. Um, in addition to finding a doctor that you can trust, I'm a big advocate of black doctors, a huge advocate of black doctors. I know everybody, well, I'm not going to say everybody can't have one, but if you can't try to find a black doctor and find a good one. And the reason why I'm a big advocate of black doctors is because black doctors, if they're good and if they're in tune with what's going on in the black community, there, there's not this huge cultural gap that you got to cross with them for them to understand. Uh, my doctor was Dr. Juan Johnson who recently passed. I, he, Dr. Johnson will hold my feet to the fire because he understood the issues that is going on in the black community. Now that he's passed, uh, I've passed the baton to another black doctor from his office who spent years working down uh, in Tuscaloosa and uh, in, in within uh, around Livingston, dealing with uh, indigent populations, is getting very aware and acquainted with diabetes, heart disease, all those kinds of things. That's the kind of person I want to be able to sit down and chop it up and have conversations with when I sit in front of a doctor. I, I, that's just me. So I am just really want to highly advocate that if you can at all possible find you a good black doctor to do that. Uh, the final thing I want, I will say this, I'm not going to have time to get into this, but I think there's another issue that needs to be brought to the table. And there are some theological issues that impact our community that you, you have to be aware of that, that are also uh, connected to the cultural stuff. But way before I became a member of Harvard, I was a part of a, a flavor of Christianity that emphasized divine healing prosperity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that being said, there were a lot of emphasis, uh, again, on prayer lines, positive confession, claiming your healing, all those things. 
I'm not throwing shade necessarily on them. I have some huge theological issues with that stuff today. But I know when I was enthroned in it, when I was knee deep in it, I wouldn't go to the doctor because I was already healed. I was claiming my healing. I'm already healed. So if you healed, you don't go to the doctor. And there are large numbers of our people that are in churches that emphasize that theological flavor. And, and it can end up being very detrimental uh, to their overall well-being because they are, uh, they are presuming in many respects and then uh, they're presuming on God that, well, God is going to do X, Y, or Z. And so they stop taking the medication because they're sitting under some theological framework that's saying that if you, you know, you, you're healed. So if you're healed, you need to act like you're healed. You got to walk by faith. And so that means you, you know, on, if, if taken to its natural conclusion and to the extreme, then you stop taking your medicine. You stop wearing your glasses because you're confessing uh, by his stripes, I'm healed. Well, I call those things truths on steroids. And you know the damage that steroids can do if misused and abused. Those are truths. I believe in healing. I believe God can heal. I believe God uh, can do, I don't box God in, but I think a lot of what happens is that people are presuming upon uh, God, much like the devil tried to get Jesus to jump off the temple about the pinnacle of the temple to presume on God. Well, uh, you take passages out of context and you miss and you abuse them, and then people's lives are ruined as a result of it. So, so I just want to put that on the table as well because I think it's also a huge factor, uh, particularly um, again in our communities and in certain segments of of our religious worshiping bodies. That is a huge issue. And again, I know this firsthand because I was a part of it and I know the impact it had on me. I thank God that that's no longer the case, but far too many of our um, uh, beloved brothers and sisters are unfortunately still in that. So, so be mindful of that. And, and then Pastor Mike, I just think as a church body, I think we need to continue doing these on a periodic basis. Uh, bringing people in, bringing experts into the church once we get back. Um, and and I think um, you know having Jewel to head this up is is she's the right person to do it. She's passionate about it. She knows that she stays abreast of it. And I'll be her biggest cheerleader. So uh, you know, we're good to go. All right. So back over to you, sir. Oh. Got to unmute, Bishop. You got to unmute. Uh, two things, and then I'm going to close this in prayer. Number one, um, you guys, if you're on with video, give uh, Dr. Jewel a big thumbs up so she can see you. Uh, it was awesome. Thank you, Miss Jewel. That was it was that and a little bit more. Uh, very, very good. Uh, one of the things devotionally I'd like to leave with you, and it's really um, adding on to. Uh, to what Reverend Ron has said during our prayer call last week on, on Saturday for the men, I read uh, a, uh, a piece, you probably saw it from a Tennessee pastor. And it's all about faith and wisdom not being opposed to one another. And here's what he says. I trust God and wear my seatbelt. I trust God and wear a motorcycle helmet. I trust God and there are enough life jackets in my boat for everyone on board. I trust God and I use oven mitts with really hot dishes. I trust God and lock my house at night. I trust God and have a smoke detector in my house. I trust God and take my prescribed medicines. I trust God and will follow the best guidelines to share the task of flattening the curve. Acting with caution and wisdom does not indicate a lack of trust in God. And so uh, I think that this whole idea of hyper faith, uh, Reverend, Reverend Ron, I don't know if you read the, the chats, uh, the, the comments on the chat, but uh, Elijah has uh, uh, said he's, he's requested that you write an op-ed on that. And um, I think that'd be wonderful, but because it is big in our community. 
So yeah, well, Pastor Mike, let me let me say one last thing. I was going to show it, but you can go do this on your own. Um, because again, I don't want to throw um, the whole segment of the Christian faith under the bus. Because uh, George Matthews, who pastors New Life Interfaith uh, Church in Bessemer, which is a part of those prosperity healing type churches, to his credit, on I mean, every day, he, well, at least three, day, three or four days a week, he does kind of like a, a video uh, presentation on YouTube. And yesterday, I just happened to click on his, and he did about a six or seven minute segment where he was encouraging black people to to do the things that jewel has suggested to do in terms of the COVID 19 stuff he was telling he was holding up lysol bottles and saying wipe your everything down see so he, he had gloves where he said everywhere i go i wear gloves and and he really talked about he made a statement and uh in the beginning, he, he said that there are some people, because he had just finished watching uh, Governor Ivey's uh, address, and he said, black people, brown people, you need to understand that there are some people who made a decision. They made a decision that some people are going to be casualties on the altar of economics. Now, I'm just paraphrasing what he said, mm -hmm. but that's the essence of it, that they're, they're, they know that there's going to be some huge casualties and a lot of them are going to be us. And he was really admonishing us to really do the things that we can do by, by um, again, wearing masks. If at all possible, try to get you some masks, wipe your stuff down, wear gloves, do the things that you need to do uh, in order to survive. And now he, in the same token, believing in healing and stuff like that, he said, but in the natural, you need to do your part to ensure that you, you stay healthy. So if you're inclined, you can go see that or you can pull him up on YouTube and watch it. Yeah. Uh, so again, it's about six or seven minutes and uh, I, I was really pleased to see him do that, yeah. uh, especially coming from that flavor. Can I say one more, one last thing? Yes. Um, sure. Something I've encouraged um, the seniors I talked to to do, just like you have a family tree, have a medical family tree when you get together with your family at family reunions or just gatherings, find out about your family and what kinds of things have you experienced as a group. And then you can have those conversations, but you should have a medical family tree like you have the other type of family tree. And the best time to do that is when we all get together over the ribs and the chicken. <laughs> and, and just kind of have an honest conversation, especially about mental illness. We don't want to talk about it, but that has a strong genetic connection. Yes, and so let's talk about what's happening in our families. During the times we're all together and we're having a good time, we can kind of bring up those conversations. And it's a simple thing to do, but it, it makes a big difference when you're trying to kind of combat these things. You can't fight a devil you don't see. You got to know what you're fighting against. You got to know what what your family is predisposed to. And that way you can make some real changes. Very good. Good last word, Miss Jewel. Reverend Ron, close us in prayer. Thank everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm going to make this recording available. Look in your email. Uh, I'll try and put it up on YouTube no later than tomorrow. Uh, I thought this was wonderful. Thank you so much for all of your input, your contributions. Thanks for being on with us, Elijah, uh, and your comments on the chat. Very good, uh, Miss Tisha and everybody that participated. Reverend Ron, close us out in prayer, bro. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for uh, what an awesome time we've had tonight. And I pray that we don't just uh, allow this just to be information, just more information on top of information. Thank you for, uh, for the hard work that Sister Jewel put into putting this together, Father, but I pray that we will absorb it and then put shoe leather to the presentation that she has given to us. Help us to rally our friends, our loved ones, to, to really actualize uh, the things that have been said here and take, take to heart the seriousness of this, Lord, because again, uh, we have to take ownership of this and, and, and we're the ones that they can do this. So I speak blessings over my church family. I pray that you will continue to keep us safe as we do our part to remain safe, Lord. We are praying for divine protection for all of us, Lord, as again, as we do.
the things in the natural that we're supposed to do to help ensure that we stay safe. I pray that you will bless all of us with a restful and a peaceful night of sleep. In Jesus' name, amen.